Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another in a continuing series of virtual author events. Of course, if you'd like to find out more about our author events, you can always visit our Facebook page, or you can see our recorded sessions later on our YouTube channel as well. I would also like to let you know that if you would like to purchase a copy of our book tonight, you can do so from Eagle Eye Bookshops. We'll already have the link where you can order that put into the chat. And I would like to remind you that if you would like to ask a question after the formal presentation, feel free to type those questions into the Q&A section or put them into the chat section and we will ask those in turn from our speaker. We're so pleased tonight to have our guest, Seamus McGraw here. He is the author of several books, including the critically acclaimed The End of Country, Dispatches from the Frack Zone, Betting the Farm on a Drought, Stories from the Frontline of Climate Change, and A Thirsty Land, The Making of an American Water Crisis, which discusses the face of climate change and the population growth to innovative technologies for increasing water supply. He has been a regular contributor to many publications, including the New York Times, the Huffington Post, Playboy, Popular Mechanics, Reader's Digest, The Forward, Spin, and he has appeared on Fox Latino. He has received the Freedom of Information Award from the Associated Press Managing Editors, the Golden Quill Award, as well as many honors from the Casey Foundation for the Society of Professional Journalists. He is, of course, here tonight to talk about his new book, From a Taller Tower, The Rise of the American Mass Shooter. It, of course, is a very sensitive subject for many of us and a very timely subject. In looking at some of the latest figures for this evening's event, the Violence Project, which compiles a database of fatalities and shootings across the United States, lists that there have been 29 shootings with four or more fatalities in the past five years. And whether it's in Colorado or Virginia Tech, or even here in Atlanta, these things are taking place with increasing frequency. And as many of us search for answers, sometimes the only things that we're given is thoughts and prayers. But these atrocities are continuing to occur. And this book examines how those things and how those people had their motivations tipped to become the mass shooters that they were. And that this just didn't start recently. This started 55 years ago at the University of Texas in a tall tower. And we are still no closer to having any more answers today. But please join us in the conversation and please join me to welcome Seamus McGraw. Seamus. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Before I begin, um, there's a thing that I do whenever I do one of these, uh, these events. I'm a big believer in the idea that a book is not an artifact to be put on the shelf, and it's certainly not the end of a conversation. It's the beginning of one. And we have a limited time tonight. I don't want the conversation to be bound by that time. Um, so I'd like to share with you my, uh, my cell phone number is 570-236-4050. My email address is SeamusM at PTD.net. That's P as in Peter, T as in Thomas, D as in David.net. I'm Seamus McGraw on Facebook. I'm Seamus McGraw on Twitter. Um, I invite you uh, sincerely to uh, whatever conversation we begin today um, to continue with me and uh it's selfish it's selfish i i learn something every time i do this um and these conversations continue for a very very long time so please join me um <sighs> joe made the point that we are in the grips of a 50 plus year long atrocity that did indeed begin on August 1st, 1966, 
when an Eagle Scout and Marine climbed to the top of the tower at the University of Texas and unleashed what has become an unrelenting period of mass public shootings. I think it's a measure of how damaged we've become. That we have to define these atrocities by four or more deaths. This is in a lot of ways only a small portion of the crisis of violence in this country. But many of the same factors that are at play in these shootings, which we look at in the book through the eyes of those who have been lost to them, those who have survived them, even those who have committed them. are not confined to one place. You guys in the greater Atlanta area have just recently been touched by one of these atrocities. But you know what? I'm willing to bet that for many of you, you've been touched at a distance by these atrocities before. If you don't mind, I'm gonna read a little bit, kind of put this into perspective for you. It's from a chapter in the book called The Fog of War in Peacetime. There's a wonderful phrase, the fog of war. What the fog of war means is war is so complex, it's beyond the ability of the human mind to comprehend all of the variables. Our judgment, our understanding are not adequate. Former US Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. You'd think by now we'd have a word for it, a word to describe the way the horror, the trauma, the confusion, and the misconceptions spider out from the scene of a mass public shooting in a digital instant, touching not just those who are at ground zero, but all of us, turning millions of us into survivors or witnesses to an atrocity in real time. Trauma is one word, yes. So is terror and chaos. In combat, they call it the fog of war, but we have no word for the fog of war in peacetime. You can see how profoundly the trauma of the fog of war in peacetime affects even those who are trained to face it. It's etched in the blank stare of the veteran police officer we met in chapter three, who, when faced with the brutal massacre of children in his hometown, simply erased the memory. I took the perimeter, he insisted. You can hear it in the creak of the stairs late at night as the first cop threw the door at the massacre at West Nickel Mines pads to his sleeping daughter's bedroom. You can feel the awful weight of it in the voice of a young police officer summoned to Santa Fe High School near Galveston, Texas in the moments after a shooting, ordered to hold the line to be part of a force deployed in accordance with best police practices to stop the killing so that he and his comrades could stop the dying. All the while, his own mother, a substitute teacher at that school, lay dead or near dead inside. I'm supposed to protect and serve people, he later told his family attorney. I couldn't even protect my own mother. Indeed, 
In this fog of war and peacetime, we are demanding that our first responders, our police officers, our EMTs, our firefighters face horrors on their home turf as great as any they'd find on the bloodiest foreign battlefield. That's something we haven't asked of American soldiers, at least since the Civil War, and yet we demand that our first responders do it. We look away when they stumble out of the gun smoke and blood and double over retching in the bushes as the police officers reportedly did when a combat veteran armed with a 45 caliber Glock 21, a cache of extended magazines he had smuggled across the state border from Nevada and a knife killed 12 people before killing himself at the borderline nightclub in Thousand Oaks, California on November 7th, 2018. Among the dead, as will see later in this chapter, was Teller Fanos, an ex-sailor who'd already been traumatized just over a year earlier when he'd helped pull the wounded off the killing field below the towering Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in Las Vegas during what remains the highest casualty mass public shooting in our history. The borderline that young man's mother and father, Mark and Susan Orfanos told me was supposed to be his haven his safe space. It's a grim measure of our times that a young military veteran had heroically faced combat twice in his life and both times it was at home. When responders found Telorfanos' body, they discovered that not only had he been shot, he had also been stabbed once in the neck, an indication the coroner told his grieving mother that Telarfanos had gone down fighting. It's deathly cold solace, but it gives his mother some shred of comfort to think that he didn't die afraid. I tell myself that Tell was so angry that this person was doing what he was doing that he just flew at him, Susan Orfanos tells me through her tears, lapsing for just an instant into the present tense, a sign that the trauma is not and perhaps never will be in the past. I don't want my son to be afraid, she says, or to hurt. And I tell myself that Tell would have been so angry, he would have confronted that man and it would have been over and so. In the aftermath of these atrocities. We focus, understandably perhaps, on the killers or their possible motives, or more compassionately, we recite the names of the wounded and the dead, and so we should. But often our incantations drown out other voices we should listen to. We should hear them out of compassion, yes, but out of self-interest as well. There's much we must give back to those first responders, like the ones who staggered, drenched in blood and choking on gun smoke out of the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, after a steroid abusing gunman with a history of alleged domestic violence, a valid state firearms license, license and an image of himself as an Islamic avenger, opened fire and killed 49 people at the gay friendly nightclub, a place the killer was reportedly known to frequent. Take a few steps back from ground zero in any of these attacks. And the fog of war and peacetime is every bit as poisonous and impenetrable. You needn't go far. Just travel a few yards down the hallway from the classrooms at Sandy Hook where children were murdered to another classroom where frightened children huddled, fearing that they would be next. What can you say to a father whose nine-year-old son is tortured by nightmares? who is facing years, perhaps decades of therapy, to come to grips with the traumatic memory of hearing gunshots and the awful silence between them. A child who is stalked in his sleep by the image of a man all dressed in black, his face obscured, pulling at his classroom door. You can tell him that it wasn't the murderer trying to get him, but rather a cop making sure that the door was locked, making sure that the child and his classmates were indeed safe before moving on to make sure other children were too. And that would be absolutely true. It was indeed a cop who was there only to protect him. But would that knowledge exercise the picture of a maniacal faceless killer all dressed in black that possesses this child's dreams? When your nightmares are forged out of gunmetal, they don't bend easily to facts.
hog spreads. There aren't enough police barricades or enough rolls of bright yellow police tape in the world to confine it to the perimeter of a crime scene, not in a world as deeply interconnected as ours. Not in a world where news, imperfect and incomplete, can circle the globe in the time it takes a dying heart to stop beating. And it isn't just the mass media that spreads the fog. Consider this. When the cops finally made it into the charnel house that had been the Pulse nightclub, it wasn't just the blood and the stench of murder that knocked them back on their heels. It was the surreal sound of so many cell phones left behind by those who had fled the massacre or still in the hands or pockets of those who didn't, chirping, buzzing, ringing, some playing a macabre merengue. And who was calling? Everyone they knew. When they found Tel Orfanos' body on the floor of the borderline nightclub, he still had his phone. There were over a thousand texts on it, his father tells me. There were a couple of hundred voicemails, people calling him from all over the country who knew him, asking him if he was okay. That's hundreds of people, perhaps more than a thousand from every corner of the nation, touched in real time by the trauma of one death in one mass shooting. Multiply that by all the dead and all the wounded and all those who've been spared and all the churches and nightclubs and synagogues and schools, all the malls and Walmarts and movie theaters, and you see how the trauma of these rare atrocities spreads like a virus across the globe. Indeed, the atrocity at the borderline, just down the road from the Orfanos' home, had already touched people across the country before Mark and Susan Orfanos had even learned that it had happened. They'd sent their son their usual goodnight text and had gone to bed only to be awakened to their nightmare at 2 a.m. by a phone call from a close family friend from the other side of the country. Tells godmother who had just learned the massacre from the news they immediately flipped on the television and desperately called their son. His voice mailbox was full. In our hyper-connected digital world, linked by social media and the phones in our hands, the immediacy of the trauma is felt by thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps millions in an instant. Even before the first breathless reporter arrives on the scene, even before the cops do sometimes, Twitter explodes, grainy cell phone videos punctuated by the sound of gunfire or of a terrified survivor weeping and screaming ricochet around the world. It's horror with a hashtag. There is no context, no big picture. You can never make sense of the senseless. And when you're running for your life, you don't even try. There are just jagged shards of terror. Indeed, as we saw at Christchurch and at Pulse, sometimes the killers even broadcast themselves on social media to amplify the horror and to bask in it. And the fog of war in peacetime and the trauma that works in the mist spreads. One does not have to be a combat soldier in war or visit a refugee camp in Syria or the Congo to experience trauma, psychiatrist and researcher Bessel van der Kolk writes in the prologue to his landmark book, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind and Body in the Healing of Trauma. He is writing specifically about those and the closest concentric rings to trauma survivors, their families, their friends and their acquaintances. But he notes that the effects radiate out from there, touching those who know them until at last, it can affect our histories and our cultures. It's a drifting fog and it's boundless. I caught a glimpse of the spreading fog myself not so very long ago, when in the wake of another deadly active shooter situation, an old friend, woman I had not spoken with in years reached out to me on Facebook from across the country just hours after she had watched her best friend die from a killer's bullet. I called her immediately and we talked for about an hour. I'm not going to tell you what she said, 
I'm not even going to tell you which of the many active shooter situations she had survived. None of that is any of your business. She didn't reach out to me because I am a reporter or because she knew I was working on this book and I didn't call her for information or for another story of her book already too full of them. She reached out to an old friend because she had experienced an unimaginable trauma and was in pain. And I called her back to share that pain and to offer what solace I could and the fog of war in peacetime and the trauma spread further. And that fog does not just spread through space. It also spreads across time. It travels from one generation to the next. You can see that in your own children's eyes. Hear it in their voices when they tell you about the lockdown drills they had at school. There's a coda to that story. I read this same part the other day when I had the opportunity to sit down with Mark and Susan Orfanos again during a uh, podcast for a bookstore in Los Angeles. And the moderator, the guy playing Joe's role tonight, felt incredibly silent throughout the conversation. And when it was over, he told me and us that he too had been touched by this crisis. Atlanta, Boulder, Bryan, Texas, they don't have boundaries anymore. El Paso, they don't have boundaries. We're all touched by this and it takes a toll. In the book, Dr. Richard Friedman, a psychologist and sociologist, brother of uh, the singer Kinky Friedman, who um, helped immortalize the mythic image we've created around the murderer at the University of Texas on August 1st, 1966. But more importantly, Richard is in a way a trauma survivor himself. He lost his best friend that day. and has made a career studying and lecturing about trauma. And he talks about the impact on the limbic system and how it alters our thinking, alters our behavior, how in many ways it exposes us to danger. and continues the cycle of violence. And he says that he believes that there is such a thing as a national limbic system. And that we are as a nation, a people traumatized 
by the crimes we allow to continue. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. There is no easy way forward. This, these atrocities, and let me be very clear. I use the word atrocity advisedly. These are often described as tragedies and I bristle every time I hear that word. Tragedies are things that just happen. Atrocities are crimes that are committed and we allow them to be committed. either by action or inaction. There's a line I use throughout the book. It's the opening line of the first chapter. There is no silence on earth deeper than the silence between gunshots. It's deafening. It drowns out everything else. It's over half a century. We've got to find a way to break the silence. Now, I don't want this to be a lecture. I want this to be a conversation. I want to throw open the floor and see if there are things we can explore together that may begin to help us at least wrap, around, wrap our minds around the scope of the problem the scope of the crisis. Excellent. Well, thank you, Seamus. And as he invited you all to do, please feel free to go ahead and put your questions either in the chat or in the Q&A feature. Um, and we'll go ahead and, and read those and start this discussion. Um, we do have a few questions that have already popped up in Wonderful. the chat. Um, but before I, I kind of get to those, because they're probably going to get into the real meat of the discussion for tonight, you know, before we, we started the recording and, and live, we were talking a little bit about the book itself and how even I kind of approached reading through it was that I kind of skimmed through it and the title, the chapter titles caught my eye and then I went in for each of those and you were mentioning how you really formulated and structured that book. <coughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that before we get into some of the, the you know, meteor topics for tonight? This is, um, I'm writing about a national trauma. And it is, I have to write with the understanding that I'm asking a tremendous amount from the reader. And so I have to be kind. And so I've written the book in a way that I hope people can find various ways into the book. That there are a number of entry points. You don't necessarily have to read it in the order it's written. Um, I think it's useful to do that, but it's not necessary. More importantly, you'll find as you read the book that I've gone, um, I struggled with this 
And I'm not sure how successful I was, quite frankly. Um, I did not want this to be a, uh, for lack of a better phrase, cop porn. There's, there are very few depictions of actual violence in the book. In fact, there's only one shooting, which I think we may address based on one of the questions coming up, um, in which I describe the violence itself, and that's only because it exposes the weak narcissistic killer for the fraud that he is. The rest of the time, I try to find another way of um, expressing the weight, the horror of these things in a way that, quite frankly, we've not built up defenses to, we're not inured to, that also make the weight of it on more uh, obviously undeniable. So, for example, I don't describe what happened in those two classrooms at Sandy Hook. What I do instead is I introduce you to a veteran police officer, a member of one of the first tactical teams into the building in one of the classrooms who is so completely overwhelmed, a veteran, hard bitten cop, so completely overwhelmed by what he saw in that room that he simply erased the memory and replaced it with a false one. They question him, they debrief him. He's not lying when he says, I took the perimeter. It's not true, but it's not lying. That's the weight. that we ask those people to bear and that we bear ourselves. So I've tried to approach the book that way. The other thing that I've done to the degree that I could is jettison the arm's length neutral approach to describing these killers in particular. Because I think outrage is valuable. I think outrage may be our way forward. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Seamus. So let's get into, we have some in the Q&A and have some over here in the chat. So let's just go ahead and get into them. So um, Mark and Helen's questions kind of are good follow-ups for each other, it seems. So Mark asks, what factors of these American massacres are so uniquely American that the massacres do not occur in other countries with the frequency that they do in the United States. And Helen asks, um, what do you believe it is uniquely or characteristically American about this phenomenon? Let me answer the question this way. I did not set out to write a 2100 count indictment for accessory to murder for my culture. But that's where I ended up. There is no denying that the ease and availability of firearms and particularly a type of firearm that is favored indeed fetishized 
to borrow a word used by um, Professor Malloy in the book, by these killers. But that's not the only fact. This takes place and has developed at a time when all our culture has become more self-centered, when narcissism became a virtue, when grievance and a sense of victimhood became a commodity, This has developed during a period of time when, as I said before, we were at once more isolated from each other, when we literally didn't know, came to not know our next door neighbor, and yet knew the most intimate details because of our hyper-connectedness of the lives of strangers around the world. And so we cluster into these communities, of these floating islands of rage, these seething cesspools of grievance and within that, within that wounded culture, you add the mix of guns, particular guns. It almost makes this inevitable. I think one of the things that I find most fascinating um, Mark makes the point that they do not occur with such frequency in other countries, and that's true. Okay, even by the way, countries where you do have a fair number of firearms. I think what's fascinating is when you look at where they do, there is a distinctly American fingerprint to them. The manifesto of the murderer in Norway who slaughtered children on an island uses the word America or the United States hundreds of times. The Christchurch killer, the definition of a cowardly fraud had a little picture of George Washington on his fake manifesto. When these happen abroad, more rarely than they happen here, certainly, they happen with a peculiarly American fingerprint. And I do think that's it. I do think that's it. I think it's, I think it is quite frankly, um, to embrace this sense of aggrieved victimhood, that requires a certain level of privilege. People in countries who don't have our privileges would view that status as a cause of shame. We build television networks and political parties around it. Does that answer your question, Mark and Helen, Helena? You no, know, Seamus, I kind of want to, um, there was something in your, your answer where you, you talked about um, you know, the guns and accessibility and, and, and such. Um, in your answer, and you know that brings you to the the one chapter that um, you know stuck out to me, which it was chapter eight. I cling to my gun, you cling to yours. Um, you know, of course, has the 
epigraph from Revelation. But in that chapter, um, you know, you mention, um, you know, Justice Scalia's um, you know, writing on the Second Amendment and the limitations that he thought could be placed on the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. but also looking at the fact that, um, you know, the really oh, the first piece of, of firearms legislation we had was in 1934, which was after the Valentine's Day massacre. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the shootings at the University of Texas took place in 66. So mm -hmm. 32 years after that, mm -hmm. you know, we, we had this first atrocity. And then, you know, now we're 55 years from that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, it seems that the only thing that, that spurned any kind of thoughtful actual legislation um, was Al Capone being gunned down in a bar. Um, and and we're, we're sort of not, you know. Well, actually he died behind bars, but gunned oh, down you know, other people in a bar. Gunned down other people in a bar, sorry, sorry, yeah, that's true. I think that goes to, first of all, I think that goes, the idea that we so, so romanticized that, um, the idea that we take, um, for all intents and purposes, sociopathic killers and elevate them and, have, and always have um, to a kind of uh, national mythology. I think that's problematic. Um, I do think that it is, um, that it is, and, and yes, uh, it, somebody just noted, um, the Brady Bill was, what was a result of the uh, of, of the, the 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 attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan? Um, I think what's happened though is that we have made these things. Weapons are not just um, totems for the killers. They've become, to a very great extent, um, a cultural touchstone. Um, we've made them, we've made the general idea of weapons, of firearms, um, specific to our tribes. I think that's, in the book I talk about, um, I talk a lot about this concept of the good guy with the gun, okay, and how there's a great deal of myth to that. Um, there is one in particular that I talk about, uh, an absolute hero at Southern Springs, Stephen Littleford, who on a Sunday morning when a massacre was going on in the church down the road from his house ran barefoot with his AR-47, or AR-15, I'm sorry, with his AR-15, um, called the, the, the killer out. Killer dropped his AR-15, came out with a handgun, they exchanged fire. Williford didn't kill him, but gave chase, and the guy ultimately killed himself. Williford um, is a remarkable man, an absolute hero. There's no question about it. Every discussion I've heard about him, apart from the one I had with him, puts the emphasis on the last word when they describe him as a good guy with a gun. Wilford tells me, and I believe him, that even if he hadn't been able to get his gun safe open that morning, he still would have gone down there. It wasn't a good guy with a gun that interrupted that killing. It was a good guy. Now, I would trust Stephen Williford with any weapon on the face of the earth. I would trust him with the nuclear football before I'd trust a lot of the guys who've had their fingers on it lately. And there is absolutely no regulation that could ever be placed on firearms, that a guy of Williford's courage, character, and humility couldn't sail through. The problem is, 
Stephen Mulifer doesn't trust me or people like me. He doesn't believe and I could not convince him that any efforts at reasonable gun control would not be an assault on his fundamental rights with an ulterior motive. I talked a little while ago about the fact that the crisis in this country rests on more than just firearms. Of the factors that contribute to these, the sad truth is that firearms may be the easiest part of the puzzle to address, but we can't, we can't. We may call it privilege, we may call it rights, but right now we're locked in and virtually in track. Now, I will say this, I will say this, as you just noted, John, there's hardly a day that goes by. You cling to your gun, I cling to mine. There is hardly a day that goes by from, say, the middle of October until the middle of January when I do not have a gun in my hand. But you know what? I have four kids. Not one of them has any interest in touching a firearm. And so while I can point to a guy like Stephen Sutherland and say, this is a man who I think embodies a lot of the heroism and virtue a man who I could deal with, were it not for the cultural divide. It's not Stephen Williford that we hear from. It's an out of control adolescent like Briscoe Kane, who turns around and you know screams that uh, yeah he wants Beto O'Rourke to just come and try and take his guns. What a fake and fraud and phony. But you know what? That's the debate we've got. And unless we can get past the Briscoe Kings and find a way of reaching and building trust with the Stephen Williford's, I don't see that there's a way forward. So Tom had put a question into the Q&A portion. Um, that it kind of deals with that as well. And Tom said that he thought that Virginia Tech would spur change, but it didn't. And he thought that Newtown would spur change, but it also didn't. And you know, he asks, how could dead children not spur that kind of change? Um, and then he asks, what is it going to take to spur change? And um, why do these atrocities recede so quickly for us? Why, why, you know, it's on the news for a few days and then they go away. Yeah. Until the next one. Yeah, until the next one. No. Um, I'm not quite, I'm not quite as um, skeptical as Tom may be on this. I do think, except for the handful of old white guys in power at any given time, I do think um, there is a growing course of American people who are a, as I just said, for whom weapons are less a cultural touchstone than they are for a 
declining sect section of the American people. Um, I think you look at even things like some of the proposals that I, I think are insufficient, but are at least uh, out there now. Um, background checks, you know, resisted, okay. Supported by the vast majority of the American people. I think you could probably put everybody who opposes it um, on a friend's 100 foot yacht at this point. Um, that hasn't yet translated into political action, but you know what? Eventually it's going to. Eventually it's going to. The other thing too, is that we have to change the way we tell the story. It, 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 these may fade from the headlines fairly quickly, but they still resonate with us. I think they still resonate with the American people. I think the American people are able to draw a line in their minds between the atrocity committed in your community two weeks ago, the atrocity committed in Isla Vista in 2014, given much the same justification, the massacre at Olubis in Killeen, Texas in 1991, when the murderer barged in and said all the women of Killeen are vipers. And I think far more slowly than we should, far more slowly than we must. I think we're reaching a point where it becomes critical mass. My kids wouldn't even know how to load my gun. And part of me, part of me thinks that, yeah, maybe there is something lost there because as I freely admit, okay, my gun, for those of you who don't know, I, I now only use a flintlock. I only carry the weapon that the second amendment more or less explicitly gives me the right to carry. But it's a fetish item for me too if I'm to be perfectly honest. It's an image of a man I'd like to be and am not. My kids have no interest in it at all. And their kids, they'll have less. I honestly believe that if you wanna talk about the greatest threat to the Second Amendment as laid out by Scalia and Heller. It ain't Joe Biden and it ain't me. It's Briscoe Kane. Yeah, I, I want to remind folks if you have any questions since you know, we're approaching eight, go ahead and either put those in the QA for us or the chat as well. Um, you know, I mean, I grew up in West Virginia um, and, you know, back in the days before you had faculty work days and things like that, you know, the first day of deer season was mm -hmm. the largest day of absences for most people. We don't um, even have school in this state on the first day of deer season. Mm. Yeah, it's, well, you know, it's, I mean, I honestly wouldn't know how to load a gun. I mean, my father, <laughs> my, my father went deer hunting and, and you know, um, I, I jokingly told the story that I was sent back to the car because I was turning the pages of the book I was reading too loudly for him. <laughs> um, so I, I, I never had any interest in him and tell you how to use a gun. But, you know, and a lot of my ignorance too is like, I didn't realize that um, a lot of the people that I went to school with, um, you know, they, they, they hunted out of necessity, you mm -hmm. know, in more areas of West Virginia. Yep. Um, but, you know, I mean, that goes though to the difference in you with your flintlock and, and this grandstanding that we sometimes see, you know, right. Charlton Heston, you know, 
waving the gun aloft and, and saying, you know, from my cold dead fingers. And, and, you know, I mean, I think his son recently came out and said, you know, he, he really didn't have any interest in firearms, but he was about rights and individuals' rights more mm -hmm. than anything it is why he was such an adamant um, defender of this and, and why he was, you know, affiliated even with the NRA. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with the fact that Charlton Heston was going to go out and shoot deer on the first day of deer season. It was more of a, a rights issue. And, and that's what it comes down to. It comes down to this idea. It, it goes beyond the, it, it, look, the reality is the weapons we're talking about in, in particular, these are not hunting weapons. And no one intends them to be hunting weapons. Okay. Um, they are weapons that turn around and say, and as I go into in the chapter, when you talk about the blessings of the gun with the, uh, with the Unification Church up here in Newfoundland, Pennsylvania, okay? The idea that every man is a sovereign, okay? Um, that goes well beyond. That goes well beyond um, anything that has to do with the, with the notion of a firearm as a tool. And I do think, um, Helena once again raises a point. She says, the white male mythology in America seems to fetishize guns, traditional roles architected by Hollywood. Do you see a race cultural delineation? Um, Seamus, before you run into that one, the, there's a question that came in the Q&A portion, mm -hmm. uh, Carmones, that I think will work well with that as well. Because okay. they're asking about, um, is our contribution as the top exporter of weapons worldwide a factor in this crisis? I'm not so sure. I, well, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure the fact that, that we export weapons is necessarily a factor. Um, I do think, I do think that it's, I think the overriding archetype um, is, I think, let me put it this way. White male mythology um, is an interesting turn of phrase. The archetype is certainly white male, but it's not embraced only by white men. It's, it's interesting to me that um, regardless of the ethnic identity of the shooter himself, and it generally is a him, not, in, not exclusively, not exclusively by any stretch of the imagination, but generally is a him. When you break, the, break it down, you find that the representation is more or less in line with the population at large, but the image, the cowboy with the gun, I think that transcends um, the individual ethnic identity of the shooter. Again, that's something that seems to infect the culture. And at the center of that there's a there's a, a moment in the book when I sit down with a with a killer a guy who committed an atrocity at a place called Simon's Rock College. Now this was a young man bought the weapon and used it the day he turned eighteen. He was a uh, an immigrant from um, Taiwan. favorite movie was Red Dawn. He had embraced the American dream lock, stock, and barrel, to use an unfortunate turn of phrase. And I think one of the most fascinating things in that discussion I had with him, and I can't tell you whether the guy was trying to push my buttons. I can't tell you whether the guy was saying what he thought I wanted to hear. And I'll leave it to the reader to decide that. But at one point during the conversation, I asked him, whether or not a good guy with a gun would have stopped him. 
And what he said to me was absolutely chilling. He said, I thought I was the good guy with the gun. Because that's the myth that I think Helena and the Carmonists are raising. Well, well, as we are winding down here, um, let's talk about you because you, you've written on multiple issues, water crisis and, and, and um, farming and things like that. What's, what's your next focus? What's your next book or, or article going to be about? Did they tell you to ask that question? They, I'm, they um, did not. But... I'm done. Oh, really? I'm done. And I'll tell you why. I am a 62-year-old white guy. Um, I have done my best. <laughs> to look beyond the perspective of a 62 year old white guy. And I think to some degree I've succeeded, but the reality is um, I think we've heard enough from 62 year old white guys. I think it's, I've had the, I've been blessed in having the opportunity to have had a platform for several books and to explore some of my own limitations in them. I think it's time to give some, somebody else a chance. So to the degree that I can help um, younger writers, more diverse voices, that's what I'd like to do for the next chapter. But I'm done writing books on my own. Well, okay. Com okay. Completely noble. Absolutely. I'm not noble. I'm, I'm also old and tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can use that, you know, personally, I would say, you know, go with the noble thing. It's, it's great for award dinners. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. not before any of those either. So. <laughs> Well, it is the eight o'clock hour. Um, I don't see anything else that has come in, but I thank you all who participated in the discussion and your questions. Thank you once again, Seamus. Oh, thank for, you. Sir. From a taller tower and this discussion. Um, you know, you may not be doing it anymore, but you are definitely a good guy with a pen. Um, so, you know, maybe keep a journal just, you know, <laughs> you know just, just in case, just in case. If you'd like to order a copy of the book, don't forget the order link is in the chat section from Eagle Eye Books. There are local booksellers um, in this event. Um, our independent bookstores have done so much for us and for so many communities across the United States during this pandemic. They're doing books by mail. There's some are delivering books to doorsteps. Some are offering curbside pickup and doing pop-up shops here in Decatur, around Georgia, around the country do patronize your local independent bookstores. Do especially patronize those stores that are owned by um, black individuals and are black independently owned stores across the country. They are so vital to our communities and they also need our support as well. Absolutely. Once again, thank you so much, Seamus. Thank you so much for having me. Support your indie bookstores. Thank you all so much for allowing us into your homes this evening. We will see you all again very, very soon. Have a safe evening. Bye-bye.